And so our first speaker is Jason Whitlock, and he has a, a master's degree from New Orleans Baptist Seminary and a doctorate from Southeastern Baptist Seminary in, where's, I know it's in North Carolina. Yeah, Wake Forest, North Wake Carolina. Wake Forest, yes. In fact, I need a power core. This laptop's about to die. Oh, is it oh. on? Yeah, that's on. It's getting, it's getting electric, electricity. Yeah, it's charging. Oh, no, it's just disconnected. Huh. Plugged in charging. Uh, Jason's presentation is oh, bad, bad. his PhD dissertation, which is on your disc. Uh, David Farnell's book and his dissertation were too big to put on the internet to download. So, but they're on your CD. If you do not have a device that has a CD, then you can have a friend do it and you know somehow transfer it over to your computer in the name of Jesus, of course. <laughs> Ready? Yes. Okay. I think so. Let her rip. I have to apologize. I always have computer difficulties whenever I get up and speak. I don't know what it is. Um, I, I won't bring up the subject this year, but get a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> so so here, here we go. Already, already starting it off bad. Bad like blood that. already, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've got my laptop down here. This is, uh, it's really weird because it's, um, I work in a secular job as well, and I do a lot of presentations, and um, if it's routine presentations that I give, no problem. I just, you know, throw, throw, but if it's ever something out of the ordinary, and it's like I've, I've got to be there at a certain time, and I, it, something always messes up. Have you ever, ever had that problem? No, no one else. Is I, I'm the only one? Okay. Murphy's Law, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, um, as, uh, as Dr. Ice uh, mentioned, I have uh, three, three degrees. I, I, I got my Master of Divinity from New Orleans Baptist through the Extension Center Atlanta. My wife and I uh, live in Atlanta. And, uh, and then I got my Master of Theology at Southeastern, um, which was on, I did my Master's thesis on the Doctrine of Eminence. <laughs> Uh, particularly on the central arguments for the imminence of the rapture. Um, and during that time, I stumbled upon some difficulties because in that thesis, I was cataloging all the different arguments. And, and hopefully you know that imminence is one of the key foundations of a pre-trib rapture. Um, and just so you know as well, my, my supervisor, my professor that was watching me through both my master's thesis and my dissertation is a post-tribulationist. Um, so both of those degrees and they were on pre-tribulation and had to get past him before he went to the other readers. <clears throat> Which, you know, he's a very godly man. Uh, he was very fair. And I think it, it, in the long run, really helped out my arguments um, and helped me fine-tune it much better since he was uh, not of my direct uh, beliefs. But when I was going through my master's thesis, <clears throat> I uh, stumbled upon this issue as far as what does it mean, what does the coming of the Lord actually mean? Uh, are we talking about the rapture? Are we talking about the second coming? Or are we talking about the post-tribulational appearing? What are we actually talking about? Uh, because I really needed to nail that down, and I didn't really get it nailed down during my thesis, but I was able to come down on the eminence of the rapture, because if I just said the eminence of the second coming, or the eminence of the glorious appearing, then we're talking about the end of the tribulation, and that's a different topic altogether. But if we're talking about the eminence of the rapture, then we got something to, to talk about and that we can argue about, but then we have a problem with... Uh, we're saying, are we, are we saying that the rapture is imminent and the other passages that talk about the coming are not imminent? And it really gets into a very big confusion because then we're just basically preaching to ourselves and we're not actually arguing for a pre-tribulation rapture when we're talking to a post-tribulationist. Um, so that started me thinking about the, the issue about the coming of the Lord. What, Lord, what does it mean? Um, and so that, my first 
chapter of my dissertation is, is on what is the main objection to the, second, to the pre-tribulation rapture. What is the foundational thing? And so I talk about the fundamental objections and, uh, and then I talk about what has been our response, the pre-tribulation response to uh, those arguments. And then I actually propose an argument, a particular model in my introduction that I build throughout the rest of the, um, the, the dissertation. So, all right. So here it is, I already mentioned that, central arguments for the imminence of the rapture. The presentation, uh, my dissertation, as you can see, I, it's much longer than what you have in your bulletin. And it's like bait and switch, right? It's like, oh, I thought this is going to be a short title. No, that's, that's my title. Uh, I stuck by it. Um, my title is The Coming of the Lord as an Extended Unified Complex of Events. And the underlying subtitle is a proposed response to the two second comings objection to pre-tribulationism. And as the presentation goes forward, it, that'll make more sense because right now I'm sure you're like scratching your heads. It's like, man, that's a, a long title for the second coming. Just say pre-tribulation rapture. Um, so, so the problem we face is we have never been able to provide a satisfactory answer, at least to post-tribulationists, to the criticism that a pre-tribulation rapture divides the second coming into two second comings. And that, that has been a major, that has been the fundamental problem that, that I believe post-tribulationists and others, amillennialists and all the rest, have against the pre-tribulation raptures. Because they say, oh no, the, the New Testament talks about the second coming, the, the, the coming and the future coming of the Lord as a one unified event. It's not uh, multiple events. It's not the second coming being the rapture and then the third coming being the post-tribulation appearing. And I've actually seen writers um, mention that. And if we were to just define the two second comings objection, what, if we were to just nail it down, this would be it. The New, New Testament uniformly presents, and again, this is the post-tribulationist argument. They say the New Testament uniformly presents and the church has historically affirmed that the coming of the Lord is a single future, glorious post-tribulational event. Because pre-tribulationism separates in time the rapture, uh, that is the coming of the Lord for his saints, from the glorious post-tribulational descent of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the coming of the Lord with his saints, you know, it's the rapture's coming for his saints and then coming with his saints. We've heard that dichotomy before. He says, because it's different, it directly contradicts scripture and the historic belief of the church, therefore it must be rejected. So post-tribulationists say we can't accept pre-tribulationism because it's such a, a change to the very fabric of the second coming. And that fabric is, is one single unified glorious event. Whereas we're saying, no, he comes first for us and then waits a little while and then comes after the tribulation again. So in my first chapter, <clears throat> sorry. I list, I actually break it down because this is very important, uh, into the six different objections, the six different facets of that one objection. The historical, the lexical, the exegetical, the hermeneutical. I'm just going to run through these very quickly. The historical objection is that the preacher of rapture contradicts the historic belief of the church in a single unified second coming. And J. Barton Payne, which is a magnificent scholar on eminence, he is a post, eminent post-tribulationist, which is different than what you have normal. Um, but he believes in eminence. He's a defender of eminence like we are, but he just believes in the post-tribulation rapture. But he says that uh, pre-tribulationism, in its effort to maintain the eminency of the Lord's coming, has lost the classical viewpoint's appreciation of Christ's coming as one unified event. The lexical object objection for uh, let school meaning words. Uh, the key point is that the second element is the argument that the meaning and usage of the New Testament words for the Lord's coming provide no support for two comings and in fact argue for one event. And, and what they say is, well, I'll just say Anthony Hokema, who's an odd millennialist, uh, he says no argument for the two-stage coming can be derived from the use of the New Testament words for the second coming. And these words would be um, parousia, which is the New Testament word for presence or coming, uh, we read that actually in our rapture ta text, the First Thessalonians 4, uh, we who are alive and remain at the parousia of the Lord, at the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who are sleeping, you know, you know the rest. And, and that word parousia is used in that main text. And some 
pre-tribulations try to say, okay, well, there's a parousia at the beginning for the rapture, and there's another parousia at the end. Um, other words would be apocalypsis, which is revelation, at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, and appearing. Those are just different words. Also, the word for day, um, and like the day of the Lord, uh, and uh, the end. All those different words that, that various pre-tribulations have used to try to seg uh, separate the two comings of the Lord. Um, and I mentioned it there. Um, and then Alexander Reese is an older post-tribulationist. Uh, briefly stated, all these terms unmistakably reference a single event. And this is the argument that they keep making. These words, if you look at them, there's the same word for rapture and there's the same word for the post-tribulation event. So if it's the same word used both times, then, then it must be one event. And you can't say that they're different words referring to different things because we always hear about, well, the coming of the Lord. What, if it's the coming of the Lord, do we mean the rapture or the end? And if we separate the two, then it's two comings and not one coming that's being referenced. Same thing with revelation and appearing. The exegetical objection, that is really when we get into the various texts, critics in this part of the second com two comings objection, they say, they look at the three major rapture texts, which is John 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Thessalonians 4, to demonstrate there is no indication of a twofold coming. So they actually go into these different texts. And this, you can see it in you know, every rapture debate, uh, the one from 1984, the one from 2010 with uh, the three views on the rapture. They always go to these texts and they say, well, uh, these different events, you know, the post-tribulation event described in Matthew 24 looks exactly the same as uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Douglas uh, J. Moo says, any indication that this is coming is to be a two-stage event in which the rapture is separated from the final manifestation would have to come from passages describing that event. Well, I agree with that. Uh, we can now conclude that no evidence for such a separation is found in any of the three principal texts on the rapture. Uh, second, they compare these texts with the Olivet Discourse to demonstrate the unity of the rapture with the post-tribulational coming. Um, critics argue that the Lord's coming described in Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Now, if you remember, that text is after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven and all that. And then the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in heaven, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he shall sound a great trumpet and send forth his angels to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. Are you familiar with that? Well, that sounds very similar to 1 Thessalonians 4 when it says, The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, uh, and the dead in Christ will be raised. It said, that sounds very similar to the post-tribulation glorious event that happens in, that Jesus described in, in the Olivet Discourse. And of course, in 2 Thessalonians 2, they again describe it because we have the, the appearing of the Lord's coming that destroys the Antichrist. And they say these things are so similar to the Matthew 24 text. How can they be different events? And they parallel these items. The word of the Lord, taken to be the oral tradition of the Olivet Discourse, because remember the rapture text says, For we say to you, brethren, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain shall not proceed those, you know, until the coming of the Lord. That's the rapture text. Then they say the coming of the Lord, which is the parousia, um, the Greek word there. They say the accompanying presence of angels, both those texts, the post-tribulation of descent and the rapture text, both have angels mentioned. They say the trumpet, and, and, and very um, uh, to point, 1 Corinthians 15 says, uh, at the last trumpet, right? And they say, well, if it's the last trumpet, then it must be near the end. Um, then they say the resurrection occurs, which, yes, uh, there is a resurrection uh, that occurs in, in the rapture text, although it, they're really uh, not specific in Matthew 24 or 29 because it doesn't actually say re Revelation, so they're taking that by implication. The gathering of the elect definitely is in both texts. And then the common recognition that the resurrection of Old Testament saints occurs after the tribulation, connected with a trumpet and an angel, is noted to be strikingly similar, similar to Paul's description of the resurrection and rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. We, I give that to them. Uh, at the end, at the post-tribulation event, there is a trumpet, there are angels, and there is a resurrection, the same as at the rapture. 
So from a post-tribulation standpoint, yes, I, I agree with them. It does look like we're separating the second coming into two different events. Um, and so what we've done in the past, uh, pre-tribulations, we will look at these things and we'll say, yes, they're two different events, but there's too many discrepancies between the descriptions for them to be the same event. And that makes a lot of sense. And personally, to me, it is uh, definitive. I think that there, there is enough differences that there are two different events. But that doesn't solve the, pre the post tribulations argument about there being two comings. Douglas Moo again, he says, The depiction of end-time events in Matthew 24 and 25 is clearly parallel to the description of the parousia found in Paul's epistles. Everybody know what parousia means? Have y'all talked much? Say, what does parousia mean? Coming. That's the way the New Testament translates it. It means uh, coming. Um, and that's the way they look at it. In fact, the theologians have begun to say, call the second coming the parousia of the Lord. They just use it as a technical theological term to refer to the future coming. And that's really stepping over the line in my view because, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but they say the parousia found in Paul's epistles directed to the church. Particular attention should be directed to the obvious parallels between the Olivet Discourse and both 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Paul clearly describes in these two passages what Jesus depicts as one event showing that it is illegitimate to separate the parousia of 1 Thessalonians 4 and the parousia of 2 Thessalonians 2 in time. So Douglas Moo says, hey, there's one parousia, there's not two. And some of our uh, pre-tribulation brethren in the past, and I think currently as well, have separated it and say there is two different parousias, two different comings. Um, but Doug Moo is saying there's no indication in the text that that word is referring to two different events. Third, in the exegetical objection, where they just go through the New Testament and try to bring up proof text, essentially. The book of Revelation is examined to demonstrate there is no separate rapture coming. Have y'all looked in the Revelation recently? Does anybody know where the rapture is? Revelation 4.1? Are you sure? Does it say that, that John was resurrected and translated to a glorified state? I don't, I don't disagree with that text personally. Uh, I think there is typological issues there, but from a post-tribulation standpoint, it doesn't say that John was raptured. It just says that he was taken up in the spirit. You can look in the Old Testament and the same thing happens with Ezekiel and Daniel, that they're taken up in the spirit, they see a vision in the spirit, but it doesn't mean they're raptured into heaven. Uh, we see that in the Old Testament by Elijah, but that's not what happened to Ezekiel. But the thing that happened to Ezekiel where he's taken up in the spirit is the same thing that happened to John. So from a post-tribulation standpoint, that's not really a rapture text. So they say there's no, there's no rapture. And if we were to continue on, that word parousia, what does a parousia mean? Coming. It's not in Revelation at all. So... Uh, and that, that raises my antennas as well. But Douglas Moo says he presents the case from the recapitulation hermeneutic. That means that the same thing gets restated over and over and over again in Revelation. Uh, he says that that hermeneutic argues easily resolves most of the differences cited as requiring a distinction between the pre-tribulation rapture and the post-tribulation coming. So again, he is arguing against the, the pre-tribulation view that we're separating the coming of the Lord into two different second comings. The hermeneutical objection, hermeneutical, I mean, uh, interpretation, uh, sorry, it's kind of small, I'll just have to read it to you. Uh, critics object that the pre tribulationism substitutes a more complex interpretation for a natural and simple explanation of the text. Have y'all heard that before? Man, it gets old. Um, I mean, I love this. I, I found this quote not too long ago, I, I, and I thought about this when I, when I read it. Everybody know who Fox Mulder is? The X-Files, Agent Fox Mulder. No one watches that but me. Um, he has a quote. I love the quote. He says, Occam's razor should be referred to as Occam's principle of limited imagination. <laughs> if you don't know, Occam's razor is essentially says that this, if the simplest interpretation, if it works, 
should be taken and anything more complex should be cut off with a razor essentially. Uh, and and post-tribulations have beat that over our heads since the beginning. We're making it too complex. It's too difficult. You know, I shouldn't be reading this scripture and, and coming up with all this complex sequencing of events. I'm like, well, if that's what the text says, then why are you judging? And why, why are you turning it around? And I think that's it. You know, uh, they, they, don't, they cannot see, they don't want to see the more complex hermeneutic. Um, and sometimes it gets frustrating talking to them about it. But George Ladd says this, this writer, meaning Ladd, takes a basic hermeneutical principle that in disputed questions of interpretation, the simpler view is to be preferred. The burden of proof rests upon the more elaborate explanation. Has he not read Daniel's 9, uh, nine and 70 weeks? Everybody I read is like, this is a very confusing uh, passage on interpretation. Whenever you get into to hermeneutics on, on eschatology, it's going to be complex. You can't get away from it. Everybody agrees with that. But then he continues, If the coming of Christ, the resurrection, and the rapture are not a single individual event followed immediately thereby after the punishment of Antichrist and the inauguration of the kingdom, the burden of proof rests on those who would elaborate the basic outline by dividing the coming of Christ into two aspects uh, and the first resurrection into two parts. Unless such a proof is forthcoming, the necessary inference is that this division of the coming of Christ and the resurrection into two parts is invalid. And with that, he just essentially dismisses pre-tribulationism. Theological, uh, I'm going to run through these a little bit more quickly. I, you, can, you can go through it in my dissertation, chapter 1. But theological is critics either attempt to discredit the theological foundation upon which the pre-tribulation rapture is supposedly based, that is dispensationalism, or they discount the arguments that necessitate two separate events. Um, and these would be things like, well, dis dispensationalism. They say that the church and Israel aren't distinct. And since Israel is, the Old Testament definitely shows Israel in the tribulation, then the church must be in the tribulation. And that's when they get into Darby and all that mess. But then the other thing that necessitates two separate events is logical arguments, theological arguments like if the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation and all the saints are raptured and glorified and all the wicked are destroyed, who goes into the kingdom as mortals to have babies that lead to the you know, rebellion at the end? Those are theological arguments that they come up with and, and no one has ever really answered that last question about the, the mortals going into the kingdom. That, that can only be answered by pre-wrath or mid-trib or pre-trib view. Um, let's see. Practical objection. This is the last one. Critics point out that the exhortations given to the church indicate that there is no distinction between the Lord's coming at the rapture and His coming at the end of the tribulation. Uh, Douglas Moose says, Believers are exhorted to look for and to live in the light of this glorious event. And while some texts obviously place His coming after the final tribula tribulation, there are none that equally obviously place it before the final tribulation. Um, other numerous passages to Zordon and Washington, and it goes on. Ladd writes, says, all the exhortations have reference to the glorious appearing of the Son of Man at the end of the tribulation. They say that, I don't agree, but that's the argument that they make. They, uh, and one thing is they uh, talk about the Second Thessalonian text where it talks about, uh, Paul says, you know, they're worried that they're in the day of the Lord, and he gives them reasons. And, and all the post tribulations say, why did he give them reasons if they're going to go through the tribulation? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so that would be a practical objection. But it's all pointed to, and they all mention this fact of separating the second coming into two comings. Pre tribulations have written significantly on each of those individual things, but they really have not answered that single issue which is the two comings objection and these responses are good and necessary however more fundamental responses needed I think and that's what I did my dissertation on this response must deal with the nature of the coming of the Lord <clears throat> so what do I mean by the nature of the coming of the Lord Alan Holtberg in the Three views on the rapture text. He says the nature of Christ's return distinguishes pre and mid tribulation from post tribulationism in that the former two understand the coming of the Lord as a two stage event, i.e., the rapture and the return to earth, whereas the latter does not. Okay, so what it, what it means the nature of Christ's return is is it just one event or is there multiple events? 
how is it how does the nature of Christ's return whatever the model is how does it relate the rapture the tribulation the wrath the judgment of God the post tribulation appearing and the kingdom how does all that relate that is how the, the nature fits in a model for the nature of the coming Lord will be defined as how the rapture and final tribulation uh, are understood in relation to the New Testament teaching of the coming Lord so the pre-tribulational models for the nature of the coming Lord can be identified in these three models the rapture and return are related as follows okay in my I survey all the pre-tribulations uh, that I could and uh, and going all the way back to Darby in chapter 1 no one has done this before amazingly enough and this is what I said before when I was getting in my arguments on eminence for my thesis this is what I stumbled upon is because we we as pre-tribulations I don't believe adequately define what the coming of the Lord is and my professor uh, Dr. Hammond uh, Again, he's post-tribulationist, and I was saying the coming of the Lord, well, he kept asking me and grilling me on, what do you mean by the coming, are you talking about the return? Are you talking about the, the rapture? Are you talking about the glorious appearing? What exactly do you mean? And I have to be honest with you, I could not give him a good explanation. Um, because sometimes when I say the coming of the Lord, I'm talking about the, the rapture, right? But sometimes when we talk about the coming of the Lord, we're talking about the glorious advent where he returns to earth. Um, and when I looked at it, we really didn't have a very good explanation as well. But I identified three. And all three of these have been in the history of pre-tribulationism since the beginning. And I want to stress at the beginning here that th these are not judgments on any of these models. But these are the way that pre-tribulationists explain the, coming of, the second coming, the coming of the Lord, and the rapture, and the tribulation. And there's a lot of disparity between how one conceives of these things. In model one, uh, those proponents of these, this model, they just, there are two distinct comings of the Lord separated by the wrath of God. And I, I have charts. Don't worry. Their pre-trib presentation is not complete without charts. I, I get that. <laughs> um, model two, they are two phases of one second coming. And are part of one coming, but are two phases of stages separated by the wrath of God. So there's, there's still two distinct comings. Now, Model 3 is one that you probably have never heard of, but I, I will tell you this. It is, is all, goes all the way back to Darby. Um, and for some reason, for the past 40 or 50 years, it's kind of fallen off the radar. Um, and, and I talk about this some in my introduction. Uh, Dr. Walford, which... I, I, I love him. I love his writings. In fact, my thesis, I was so happy when I finished my thesis, got it published, and I looked up the call number, and my call number placed my thesis right beside John Walver's Questions on the Rapture. You know, and I mean, right beside his book. I was like, thank you. You know, I'm in the library, I'm, I'm right next to uh, John Walver's book on the Rapture. Um, but, model, but he, he is, he, he, starts talking about the two parousias and he, he starts making reference to um, not viewing the parousia as one even though there are some in his contemporary circles in the 40s they were talking about one parousia that, that, that was indicative of model three and his influence sort of uh, overshadowed model those proponents of model three and model three says they are part of one coming of the lord as an extended complex event of events including the wrath of god like man this this doesn't make sense how does that all fit in okay and again I want to make mention that these are just distinct categories of, they're, they're not meant to identify distinct categories because there are some overlap on the way people explain it uh, and they're not to judge anyone in there but I'm just trying to explain how pre-tribulations conceive and actually argue their case against post-tribulations all pre-tribulations agree as, as do I, all these in the model, agree that the rapture and the post-tribulation return are two distinct events. Okay, I don't want to alarm anyone. I say there's one coming, but these are two distinct events that are separated by a period of time in which the wrath of God falls. So on all three of those that I'm going to show you and what, which I just mentioned, there, there's two distinct events, the rapture and the post-tribulation return and the wrath of God. Now, the first one, two distinct comings. You like my drawing? I didn't get that from anywhere on, online. I did that myself. Um, we have the cross. 
We have the Lord's ascension in the clouds to the right hand of the Father in heaven. And then at Pentecost, the Lord sends the Spirit. And then we have it from the day of Pentecost. And if you look at the top on all these charts, we have the events in and from heaven on the top. It's sort of like the heavenly perspective. And then on the bottom would be events in history, you know, the, the timeline on that. And then, of course, in the middle we have where they meet. So we have the church age. And then we have the rapture coming. And they actually call, the proponents of this view call the rapture the coming. Um, his coming, he, the Lord comes for his saints. And we'll be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. And he, he basically comes down and then goes right back up. And then the glorified church remains in heaven with the Lord for seven years, at the end of which we have the second coming. The Lord comes with his saints. And then heaven is open and the Lord comes down to earth to destroy the beast and his armies and set up his kingdom. And then we got the millennium. So right here you can see how many times does the Lord come out of heaven? Twice. So we have this up and down thing. We, we go down and he gets us and then we go back up and we stay there for a little while and then we go back down. That's two second comings. Okay? I'm not arguing right or wrong. I'm just saying that I see what post-tribulations are saying. And I tell you what, there are pre-tribulations pre that are, understand this too because this is probably the most prominent view as Model 2 today because they, they have uh, seen that, that this is an issue in Scripture. And what they have done is those in Model 2 say, well, the second coming involves all the things that occur from the rapture on. This, it's all part of the second coming. And they say, okay, phase one, they'll say, they'll either say two stages, two phases, something like that that indicates that they know that there's a distinction, but they also know there needs to be some type of unity in this idea of the second coming. We, we can't just say this down and up, down and up, because Scripture... I, I tell you, Scripture doesn't even say, call the coming of the Lord the second coming. The only time it ever actually possibly references is in Hebrews 9 where it says, uh, for those of us who eagerly await Him, He will appear a second time. But it never says the second coming. And quite frankly, when I was writing this dissertation, it was, very, it was a very confusing thing to write because I, I kept having to change my term because you have to be consistent throughout your whole writing. And it was making it difficult to be consistent while I was saying the second coming here. So I just dropped second and just started using coming of the Lord. But you see what they're doing. It's down and back up. But they say this is all part of the second coming. And, and I agree with them wholeheartedly uh, that it is all one and the same. One coming. Then we get into model three. We have one coming. This is an extended complex of events. Okay, um, we have the same thing here, but do you see a difference? Well, first of all, the day of the Lord and the parousia of the Son of Man, the parousia being the coming of the Lord, they're the same, they're the one the same, and they start at the rapture and they continue on. Um, but there's a distinction in the way that these pre-tribulations conceive of the second coming, conceive of the coming of the Lord. There is no going back into heaven necessarily. And I think we need to reconceive a little bit of how we think of heaven. And I'll just interject that thought right now. Where, what is heaven? Is heaven up? Is heaven down? Heaven is all around. And in the ancient culture, up was lofty, was high, was exalted. And they talked about God being up and uh, the king being exalted and high up as a way of denigrating the common person. But you'll read very often in the Old Testament um, where God descended down on Mount Sinai. And it says he descended from heaven onto Mount Sinai. But then later it says when he was given the commandments, it says he was speaking out of heaven. Well, where was he? He was on Mount Sinai. But it says he was speaking out of heaven. It's in, that's in Exodus 20. Well, <clears throat> kind of keep that in mind. But here, in this view, the Lord descends from heaven. He raptures us up, but he doesn't go back to heaven. He's still in heaven, so to speak. He just sort of opens up heaven, and we go in. 
But the idea is that we are in the clouds or around the earth during the tribulation. And the glorified church is with the Lord around the throne of God, which is on earth or in the clouds around earth for the seven years. And then after which we have the manifestation. Heaven is opened up. This is 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Um, is opened up, and this is also Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Heaven is opened up, and then those on earth will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. But the issue is that He has been there for the entire seven years with us. And what do you think He's been doing? Any idea? What happens in Re Revelation 6? Seal 1 is broken. Seal 2 is broken. He is meeting out judgment on earth. And it is comes about of all the plagues and, and the Antichrist and the tribulation that occurs on earth is because Christ has been, has been here and He is meeting out judgment on earth sort of like a, uh, a general outside of an enemy city is sieging war on the city and at the end of it, the city succumbs and the general marches in. Same thing here. The Lord comes down. He takes us out because He doesn't want us here while He's doing that. And He basically unleashes war on earth at the end of which he opens up at the battle of Armageddon and wipes all remaining rebe rebels out of the way and sets up the earth. But the thing is that the day of the Lord and the parousia begin at the same time at the rapture. So briefly stated, Model 3 sees one coming of the Lord that begins with a pre-tribulational descent of the Lord from heaven into the clouds for the church's rapture to meet him in the air. You notice, even post-tribulations mention this, that text doesn't say he goes back up to heaven or goes down to earth. There's no mention of him doing anything after that. What is the very next thing in Paul's writing after the rapture? The day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5. But you, brother, are not, you know, you have no need that I write unto you, for the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as a, a, a labor pain upon a woman with child. So it's the day of the Lord that comes next. Number two, the Lord remains and is present throughout the tribulation with believers. From this position, just above the earth and shrouded in the clouds, the Lord meets out judgment on the earth. Number three, the Lord is enraptured believers are invisible to the natural world until the end of the tribulation. And at that time, the coming is manifested to everyone on the world, and then they will see him coming with the clouds of heaven. And the Lord will, be, will then complete his descent in openly visible glory. Okay. I wanted to read just a second. Herman, uh, see, CF Hogg and Vine. They're proponents of Model 3, by the way. They say the parousia of the Jesus Christ is thus a period with a beginning, a course, and a conclusion. This is where you have a shift in the understanding of parousia. Model 1 and 2 look at parousia as a movement and uh, an action. But those in Model 3 look at it as a time period. Uh, a come, with a, a beginning, a course, and a conclusion. Herman Hoyt affirms the second coming is in its effect covers a vast period of time and that it comprises a whole series of events. He also states that the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven to rapture his church and his continued presence in relation to events in the earth mark the next major movement in the unfolding plan of God. And uh, this view is also seen in the 2010 three views on the rapture. Craig Blazing does a very good job of showing this from the day of the Lord perspective. And uh, in my view, the parousia, the coming of the Lord, and the day of the Lord are synonymous. They're just different terms for the same thing. And despite uh, the, the various presentations, the fundamental notion is that the Lord comes from heaven at the beginning of the tribulation to rapture the church and remain, remains there meeting out judgment until he completes the descent at the end of the period. Uh, Strombeck. <clears throat> Right, so at the parousia, then the Lord descends from heaven not only to rapture the church, but to bring in the day of the Lord with its destruction. And he continues, it says, Inasmuch as parousia denotes not only the arrival, but also the subsequent presence with, 
These three occurrences of parousia of the Son of Man teach that at his arrival, the judgments of God as seen in the destruction commence. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of a lengthy quote from Craig Blazin because it really helps to conceptualize this. This is in the two, three views on the rapture, 2010 version. He says, the point is that the entire day of the Lord is a coming of the Lord in judgment. All of its destructive elements, for however long their duration, um, or however extensive their reach, are poured out by the God who has come enacting this judgment. This is true whether or not the Lord makes an appearance in or at the end of the day. The historical days of the Lord did not involve a theophany, even though they were days on which the Lord came in judgment. The theophany at the end of the day of the Lord in Zechariah 14, again, that is a symbolic, uh, synonymous with the coming of the Lord. The day of the Lord in Zechariah 14 climaxes an extended event in which the, He has come in judgment. The point being that the coming does not just take place at the end of an extended disaster, which is merely its prelude. Following the imagery of a military campaign, the entire campaign, whether the, the devastation of the countryside or the siege and battle for the city, however long these last, is due to the coming of a general and his army who are perpetrating it. Um, his coming is not merely his triumphal entry into the defeated city at the end of the campaign. His coming is the whole destructive event that completes itself when the city is defeated and he makes his entry into it. Um, so, the proposed model. First of all, I, I base my proposed model on, on model three. The coming is extended. It refers to a period of time rather than a momentary event. Two, next is the coming is a complex of events. There are many events that transpire during the extended period of time, and the coming is unified, meaning it is one event. The Lord doesn't come down from heaven, go back up, and then come back again. When He comes, He begins His reign at that point. Okay, my chart is a little bit more colorful. And I apologize here. You probably can't see that, and I was doing my best. But you'll notice some different things in heaven. Okay? The Son of Man is right now, where is He? The Son of Man is seated, is sitting at the right hand of power, and the Lord Jesus Christ is concealed. You notice in the New Testament, it talks about the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's synonymous again with the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord. But right now, He is seated at the right hand of power. Um, when He ascended, now, keep in mind, He is not on the Davidic throne. I don't want to cross that boundary. He is not on the Davidic throne. He is seated on the throne of God in heaven. Next, at the rapture, that is when the coming of the Lord occurs, the parousia of the Lord Jesus Christ begins, that period of time. And that will continue on to the end of uh, all time, until the, when He hands over the kingdom to the Father. And what I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a few minutes is that the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven is a technical term. And I believe that refers to that period of time. We have two periods of time. Do y'all remember when um, Jesus is before the Sanhedrin? It's in Matthew 26, 64. And they said, I drew you um, by God. Are you the Son of the Most High? And he says, I am. And hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Do y'all remember that statement? Two things he mentioned there, and they were both Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. The first, he is seated at he. You will see him seated at the right hand of power. That is from Psalm one ten one. Second, you will see him coming with the clouds of heaven. Now I want to ask you something. How can you be seated and coming, unless you're in a car? I mean, I guess you'd be in a chariot or something, but do you see the point here? Is that those two things don't quite conceptually if they're completely literal. They're referring to rabbinic technical phrase for the Messiah, for the sovereignty, for the reign of Messiah, when the Messiah has been crowned to be given dominion by God the Father. The first is he is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and second, he is coming with the clouds of heaven. 
And where that that one coming with the clouds of heaven refer to? Where's that? Daniel, where, seven. Daniel seven. Very good. We got scholars in here. That's what I love about pre-tribulations. We y'all love a literal interpretation of the Bible, which I do, and uh, I love it. Um, Daniel seven. We have the Ancient of Days. He is coming. He's, he's seated down, and it says. Then one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days. That is a Messianic reference, and, and those in the high priest knew that. And they knew that what Jesus was saying is, you're going to see me, and you're going to see that I'm exalted, and that God has given me dominion. Now, that occurs, that interaction occurs with both Matthew and Mark's account with Sanhedrin. But Luke, it doesn't occur that way. Luke omits the coming with the clouds of heaven. You say, why? And not only that, he, he omits the seeing part. Matthew and Mark say, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting and coming with the clouds of heaven. Luke only says, hereafter the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of power. There's a distinction. And in Acts, we see that distinction again. Nowhere in Acts do we see the coming with the clouds of heaven. All we see is seated at the right hand of God the Father. In fact... Uh, Acts chapter 7, Stephen, when he's being stoned, he says, Behold, the heavens are open, and I see the right, the Son of Man, not seat, seated, standing at the right hand of God the Father. Again, there's no mention of him coming with the clouds. That indicates to me that they're not the same thing. They're different. When we get into Revelation, what does John say in Revelation 1 7? He says, Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see Him. So there's two different points in, in the New Testament. One is that there's going to be a period of time, which currently is the church age, in which Jesus Christ is currently seated at the right hand of the power. And in Revelation, He says that my Father has granted me to sit down with Him on His throne. That is what that is. He is seated at the right hand of power. And then there's coming a future time, which Revelation talks about, whereas He is going to be coming with the clouds of heaven and every eye will see him. He is concealed now, which is what the purple is under there. On the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is concealed. And then there will be a revealing, a revelation, where he acts in history so that people understand and know that he has been given dominion. All right. Now, I'm going to go through this really quickly. I promise. I'm running out of time. Um, what I do in my dissertations, I have, after uh, I talk about the, second, the two comings objection and the, uh, the different models, in chapter 2, I look at the Old Testament. And I say, what does the Old Testament have to do with the coming of the Lord? And this is completely different. Now, in pre-tribulationists, in fact, Dr. Blazing as well in his, his book talks intensively and extensively about the day of the Lord and how it relates to the rapture. But no one has really given considerable uh, research to what the coming of the Lord in the Old Testament has to do with the rapture. You know, we always say, well, the rapture is the New Testament, and it's only hinted at the Old Testament. Well, I'm telling you that the coming of the Lord is a, of vital importance to, um, in the Old Testament concerning the rapture. In fact, I believe that so much so that... Um, when I was doing my dissertation, my, you know, I only had 300, we're, we're limited to 300 pages on a dissertation. My chapter two on the Old Testament was 129 pages. My first draft was 129 pages. Uh, because there's so much regarding the coming of the Lord in the Old Testament that has bearing on this topic. So I, I would suggest please read uh, my chapter two on the dissertation. So my model is, is granted on the fact that the coming Lord is a biblical theme that spans both testaments. I mentioned that already. Um, the coming of the Lord is imminent divine action. Okay, here's, the, here's what it means. When we talk about the coming of the Lord, we're talking about imminent divine action. Not imminent as in any moment, but imminent as in here, around us, versus transcendent. Did y'all kind of know what transcendent is? Imminent is the opposite. Transcendent meaning above, holy, external. Imminent meaning here, now, with us. If God is imminent, it means that He is right here with us, interacting in history. 
the way that the Old Testament portrays His imminent intervention into history is by language of the coming of the Lord. The coming of God is a, is a major um, idea. So when the Old Testament speaks of the coming of the Lord, it is referring to God, the Lord's direct intervention in history. The coming of the Lord is lexically uh, and exegetically, I mean, if you talk about the words and the text, is presented as the imminent presence of the Lord in a particular time and place uh, that can be called the presence coming of the Lord. And this presence coming of the Lord is portrayed through theophanic imagery. I'm going to quickly run through some examples on this. Um, first of all, there are no Hebrew words for abstract conceptions such as presence or coming. So it can't just say the Lord is present. You know, if, if the Old Testament says that in English, uh, it's really helping us out understand what's going on. It says coming. Instead, the words to be present and to come are used when the Hebrews wish to convey these ideas. <clears throat> Henry Verkler, he's an author on hermeneutics, says, when we're referring to God, except for, well, let me, let me start off with, because God is present everywhere, logic would seem to preclude any literal movement to God. Okay, that's foundational. Where is God? He's everywhere. Does God intervene in history sometimes? Yes, that's all I'm talking about. Okay, this, that, is, that is the distinction that we're making here. God is everywhere present. He is omnipresent. He is always everywhere. And the Old Testament confirms that and affirms that. But at the same time, the Old Testament, because this is different than Greek theology and, and, and other Buddha and other things where they sort of see God as this transcendent being that can't possibly interact with us. The Old Testament doesn't look at it that way. The Old Testament, yes, affirms God is transcendent. He is otherworldly. He is everywhere. And He is distinct and separate from us. But the Old Testament also affirms that He is a God that interacts with His creation. He is a God that intervenes. Why else would we pray, right? Why don't we ask God to intervene in our affairs if we didn't really believe that? Well, when the Old Testament makes that distinction, it uses the idea of the coming of God of the God coming from heaven, of the God coming in glory or descending. And Henry Verkler writes this, when referring to God except for Christ in his earthly state, the concept of coming and going does not refer to movement from one physical location to another because God as a spiritual being is omnipresent. Both the biblical and logical evidence regarding God's existence as a spiritual being, a being for whom time and space parameters do not mean the same thing as they mean for us, it indicates that the concept of God's coming and going does not refer to his movement very important. It does not refer to his movement, but from one location to another. Rather, his coming, as applied to God, often refers to God's manifestation of himself in some special way. It, it refers to him actually intervening. And the way the Hebrews, the Old Testament idea, the way they explain it is that he came in glory. He did something. He came to help. Uh, he just didn't stay up uh, lofty. Uh, for you Hebrew scholars there, i put this in, but um, the scripture readily uses bo, that's the, and that just means to come, in reference to God. Uh, the theological lexicon of the Old Testament says that approximately 40 different passages refer to a coming of the Lord, a coming of Yahweh or God. The idea of a coming of God is so pervasive, pervasive in fact, that it appears in every biblical category of God's interaction with, human, with humans and his creation. The coming of God is essentially a statement identifying his direct personal intervention in history with a specific period of time and location. Uh, Bill T. Arnold, uh, also a theological lexicon, says to come is especially significant where it describes God's entrance in space and time. This is, this is something that's well known in theology, but we never applied it to pre-tribulationism or to the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord is thus the principal idea in Scripture used to express as God's imminence. Um, and Let's see, I already mentioned there. Uh, Oswaldo Vina writes, the coming of God is synonymous with his active presence. So you can see it's just, that's the way theologians look at it. But it's not just to come. But there's other words too that I categorize as part of his coming. Other Hebrew words, talking about the Lord's imminence, is to descend or come down. The Lord came down, the Lord descended from heaven. To ascend, to go, to depart, to go out, to go forth, to visit to see, look at, inspect, to appear, to come near, and approach. If you look at those phrases, a lot of those you should be able to recognize as New Testament words referring to what will happen in the tribulation 
uh, and, and what God and the Lord Jesus will do. This language is found in text where God, the Lord intervenes in history to reveal knowledge. He comes, He descends, He arises arise to reveal knowledge. He goes and He descends to create a manager covenant. He descends on Mount Sinai uh, to judge, to save, to intervene on the eschatological day of the Lord. So the thing you need to get is the coming of God equals direct divine intervention in human history. Here's some text. Uh, Psalm 50. May our God come, for God himself is judge. Isaiah 3 says, The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into, enters again, that's come, comes into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. Micah 1 says, Hear, O peoples, all of you, listen over earth and all of it contains, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord, from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split, and, uh, and on and on. All for the rebellious house of Jacob and Israel. It, and I could go on and on about this language, which I've got plenty of citations in my dissertation. Deuteronomy 4, 34. He says, or has a God tried to go, again, to come, to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, and a mighty hand, and by an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And those are things that we see that are synonymous with the things that occur in the tribulation. What am I saying? I'm saying that the coming of God is seen in the Old Testament, like with the Exodus, and like with the wilderness wanderings, is the same terminology used by the New Testament when it talks about the tribulation and talks about Jesus Christ inflicting wrath. These are the same things. The connection I'm trying to make is the coming of God in the Old Testament, as it's described, mirror exactly the New Testament parousia or coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that begins with the rapture, that continues through the tribulation, and climaxes at the great post-tribulational period. This is the same language that we see in the Old Testament, we see in the New Testament, uh, in reference to Jesus Christ. Habakkuk says, You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. Depictions of the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> now, this is another major point that ties it into the New Testament, and it's theophany. Theophany is a word that is commonly used for God's self disclosure. It comes from the Greek terms theos, meaning God, and phanein, to appear, theophanein. Uh, it just means an appearing of God. And appearing doesn't necessarily mean a visual appearing. It means a manifestation of God in a local area, a local situation. And, and when we have a theophany in the Old Testament, we see God appear. Uh, the principal theophany in the Old Testament is uh, Mount Sinai, which we'll look at some of those in just a minute. And, and for that reason... Some scholars call theophanies in the Old Testament Sinaitic, meaning they generally include elements that are found in the monumental theophanic descent of the Lord upon Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20. Nehouse, he's, uh, he's a covenantalist, definitely not a preacher of relations. It's funny because in, I, I, I was purposely trying to stay away from um, pre tribulations in my defense. I went to amillennialist, I went to covenantalist. Um, post-tribulationists, so much of my research came from these guys because I wanted to show in their own writings that they're supporting pre-tribulationism. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> so Niehaus identifies these principal markers. Please pay attention to this. And again, I have some numerous references in my dissertation. Yahweh's coming is portrayed with theophanic language meaning thunder, lightning, thick clouds, smoke, fire, some phrases are used now for the first time, and he's talking about the, the Sinai. A very loud trumpet blast. The smoke billowed up. The smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. A subsequent account in Exodus 20 echoes the descriptions of thunder, lightning, the trumpet, the smoke, mountain and smoke, thick darkness. Do you see any of those things in Revelation? Do you see any of those things refer to the New Testament? I do. Um, Exodus 19, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe in you forever. Exodus 19, uh, it'd be good to just read the whole chapter, but I couldn't. Uh, the Lord, Lord says to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, 
and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, by the way, how long is a day with the Lord? Like a thousand years. Not a life. That's right. So it didn't happen at exactly 2,000 year uh, mark. But just keep in mind, he's gone for two days. Came about on the third day when it was morning. That means at the beginning of the third day. Um, also look at Hosea 6, 1 and 2, by the way, on that. Um, so it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Does anybody know a text that that mirrors? Very similarly, rapture text. 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord will ascend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel. We who are alive will go up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be ever with the Lord. I believe that 1 Thessalonians 4 is the initiation of the theophany of the parousia that begins the whole coming of the Lord's sequence. The Lord descends from heaven just like He descended from heaven on Mount Sinai. The people go up to meet Him. We will go up to meet Him. He descended on Mount Sinai and stayed there for the entire period. Uh, Exodus 19.18 Now the mountain was all in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. And when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, uh, Moses spoke to God and He answered Him with thunder. Um, I don't have time to go through all that. Uh, Exodus 20, all the people see the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. Keep in mind that this and many, many other texts, theophany starts with a trumpet. It starts because the trumpet is heralding the coming of God in theophanic glory. Can anyone see the glory other than the flashes of light? No. They can't see it because he is veiled by the clouds. And that is exactly what I believe will happen in, uh, in the tribulation. The Lord and his, his whole throne room will come to, come to earth, veiled in thick clouds and darkness. And the Lord Jesus Christ will call us up into that. And we will behold his glory directly. But the rest of the world will not. I don't know about the secret rapture. Everybody, I've heard so much about post tribulations hit us over the head about the secret rapture. I don't think it's going to be secret. I think the whole world is going to know that it happened. It's going to be violent. It's going to be loud. It's going to be scary. And the whole world is going to be shook up by what happened when we leave. Um, now, verse 20. Moses said, and I make a big deal about this in my dissertation. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of Him may remain with you so that you may not sin. God has come to test you. Is there a New Testament verse referring to that? What? The hour of testing. Very good. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. When God comes, one of the things He does is he sends trials, tribulations, and testing on those he's with, or that his presence is with. And he's doing the same thing for 40 years. You know, the, the Old Testament, the wilderness wanderings is a type of the future tribulation, the wilderness wanderings. And that's what this started right here with Mount Sinai. And the future tribulation is a type of those wilderness wanderings. And look here, verse 22, like I said, about heaven. Then the Lord said to Moses, Then you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. Where is he? He's on Mount Sinai. That's, the, that's where the visual appearance of him is. But he is speaking from heaven. I have no problem with saying heaven is up. I really don't. But just keep in mind that... It, we, there may be more to it. It doesn't quite fit if heaven is only up. Heaven is a different dimension. Are angels in this room possibly? Do we see them? No, because they're in the spiritual realm, i.e. the heavenly realm. It's all around us. And the Old Testament talks in that fashion. Yes, He does come down, but He also 
comes from Mount Sinai. The Old Testament is always talking about him coming forth from Mount Sinai. Um, it is the heavenly realm. Noteworthy uh, are the, on theophanic imagery is the earthquake, storm cloud, the combination of storm cloud, earthquake, and, and silence. Um, there's much that I could go through on this. Uh, the occurrence is because of the storm, theophanic storm wind. And the storm of the Lord has gone forth in wrath. And the Old Testament has this idea. See, um, I don't have much time to, to explain this, but the Old Testament, uh, when it talks about the coming of the Lord, there's one particular theme that comes to the whole thing, and that is the chariot throne of God. Has anybody ever heard that? The chariot throne of God. Can anybody give me a text in which the chariot throne of God appears? Ezekiel 1. Very good. Where else? Where? Isaiah? Yeah, it's Isaiah 6 because it's his throne. There's this idea of the chariot throne of, of God in which the cherubim are like the wheels. And they move him to and fro. And whenever God comes in judgment, he just doesn't come as this uh, amorphous being that, that's not attached to anything. No, it has his throne being wheeled and moved to the various locations of judgment. We see that most particularly in Daniel chapter 7. When it says, and the thrones are placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's talking about the chariot throne. Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel in his vision said, I saw a storm approaching. It's that storm that encircles and veils the glory of God. Um, and in, in Daniel chapter 7, which is our coming with the clouds text, we have again the chariot throne of God. In chapter 7 and I'm, I'm going to um, wrap this up with with this um, with this analogy here Daniel 7 9 through 14 we have the two visions right 9 through 14 uh, I really wish I could project on my screen um, that text um, if you have it turn to it Daniel 9 uh, Daniel 7 I'm sorry Daniel 7 We had the first part of Daniel 7 where God is coming and the Ancient of Days takes his seat. <clears throat> uh, and it says, I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels where a burning fire, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court set and the books were opened. What does that look like in the New Testament? What? Judgment Day. Yeah, it could be, yeah. It's, it's part of it because it, it, that would be indicative of any type of judgment. But there's one in particular I'm thinking about. You are so close, quick on, on John being raptured in, in Revelation 4. 4, yes. Revelation 4 and 5. Very good. What I believe here, and I don't have time to show, I'm, I'm just spurring your, your, your intellect here and, and getting your inquisitiveness out. I believe this is a picture of Revelation 4 and 5. We have God coming in judgment for those on the earth. And we have, and, and, and these aren't sequential, meaning um, verses 13 and 14, I don't believe, take place immediately after 9 through 11, um, but are different, different portrayals of different things. But in 9 through 11, or 9 through uh, 9 and 10, are a picture of Revelation 4. And Revelation 4 is what? It's all about the throne of God. It is about God coming and myriads and upon myriads uh, ministering to him. And then in, in the Daniel text here, verse 13 says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom 
that all the peoples and nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. What New Testament text does that parallel? And all millennialists agree with me on this one. They just don't realize what they're giving up, I think. Um, what, does that, what does that mirror in the New Testament? Yes, Revelation 5. Because Revelation 4 is talking about the throne, and then Revelation 5 says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, written on the inside and the back, sealed up with seven seals, uh, you know, a book. And they're claiming, who is worthy to take the scroll? They're basically saying, who is worthy to take dominion? And John, uh, a type of the church, which we will be there. And I saw between the throne, because no one was able to find it. But he says, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has overcome as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures, that lamb, uh, elders, a lamb standing, says he's in the midst of the throne. That's exactly where he should be, right? He's seated down at the right hand of God on the throne. You think of this big, as a big, monstrous thing. Uh, God's sitting there, and Jesus is on the throne as well. He says he's in the midst of the throne, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That, I believe, is... When he comes is the parallel to the Old Testament, Daniel, when he, he, the man coming with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days. I know what you're thinking. I've always thought that Matthew 24 where it says, And then they shall see him sending uh, a sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and they shall see him coming with the clouds of heaven. Please note, there's no place in that text where it says he's coming with the clouds of heaven to earth. I believe he comes to earth. Literally. We all believe the same thing on that. All I'm saying is that text in Matthew is, is saying a little bit different. It doesn't say he's coming to earth. It is saying that then they shall see the Son of Man who has already come with the He has been given dominion. Because in the Jewish mind, they're thinking coming with the clouds of heaven means that, that he has gone to the Father and the Father has granted him dominion. And that whole seven years of tribulation is demonstrating the fact that Jesus Christ has dominion, that he has been unleashing judgment upon the world, and at that point in time in Matthew's account, that's when the heavens open and Armageddon takes place. That's Revelation 19 is the same thing as Matthew 24, the heavens are open they shall see him. That's when it comes. But all I'm saying is when he says it's coming with the clouds of heaven, it's, saying it's a technical phrase for uh, him approaching and, and gaining dominion. And you can read the rest. <clears throat> and I think I'm about out of time. Um, right. Make sure. I think uh, just for the sheer fact that there's so much volume of uh, material that I could cover, I want to answer your questions so I can address them um, individually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're coming for questions. Yes, we're coming to questions. And we're actually here. The presence coming. Jason, thank you for that uh, excellent presentation. I, and I really like what you're saying. I think that takes into consideration a lot of interesting concepts, God's omnipresence um, and, and so forth, and, and this idea of the coming. I do have, um, I'm trying to conceptualize your, uh, the way you're viewing what happens at the rapture and how that correlates with John 14. You didn't, you didn't speak much about John 14, but John 14 does use a lot of uh, topical references. Mm -hmm. So Jesus speaks about my father's house as a place where he's going and preparing a place for us in that place and then coming to take us to that place. How does that fit in with your concept of what's going on at the rapture? Um, short answer is I have really no idea. 
No. Uh, I've got the thing is that heaven. Right. The, the scripture is not real specific on how to look at heaven. I know one thing is that heaven is up in the sense that it's higher than us. It's, it's above us, and that's the way the ancients viewed it. But heaven is all around, and when we are taken into the clouds, we're present around the earth in the sense that we are with Jesus in an imminent fashion interacting with history. And God's throne moves around all over the place, and I would assume that heaven... Um, is in the, the, the temple or the and and because in Revelation it constantly talks about the, the glory of God being in the temple of the temple and New Jerusalem the, those are all mingled in together so when he takes us in into the clouds he's one and the same that is taking us to the father's house but the thing I, I'm trying to get is that it, there's more nuance there than just saying up and down we're into a different realm we're into a different dimension that is invisible to physical beings and, and so taking us into the clouds right there is basically taking us into the Father's house. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I follow all that. It does, just doesn't seem to comport well with the description of John 14. I mean, it seems that at the, at the ascension, the now incarnate Christ in a resurrection body ascends to a place, which I would presume is not in the air, because he comes to the air. And it's in that place, the Father's house, where he prepares that place, those dwelling places, for us. And that, that's, I'm just having a hard time putting that together with your concept here. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, no one has ever really given me a good explanation on that either. And I'm, I'm left with uh, my own imagination on that. But I know that in Revelation 21, it says that... Uh, that I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Well, God is already on earth in our, in our scenario because um, if you remember first, um, I don't want to skip around too much, but if you remember First Thessalonians 4, Paul says, uh, we do not wish you to be ignorant, brethren, um, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Who is he referring to? He's not talking about Jesus will bring with him. He's saying God will bring with him, God. God will bring with God those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And if heaven is with God, like we said in Revelation 21, it's coming out um, from God out of heaven, then perhaps the whole throne of God is, is the city of New Jerusalem. I, I don't know. I know that every description of the throne of God, uh, if you look at Mount Sinai description, it's just vast. It is this vast expanse that you couldn't place a pavement, a crystal clear as, as sapphire. And, and we correspond that with Revelation, and, and that's New Jerusalem as well. So all I know is it's going to be amazing. It's going to be beyond, because I, I just don't know that we could really describe it all. Because even Paul said, you know, the, I was taken up into the third heaven, and I don't have words to describe what I saw. So. Wonderful, wonderful presentation, Dr. Whitlock, over, over here. We, uh, you really given us some food for thought. Uh, if the Lord is coming back at the rapture in, in the warrior mode from then on, where does the other things fit in, like the uh, the bema and you know things that are going on in the in the seven years there? That's a good question, um, and I will say this that I'm not. And this is not a new thing, um, but I'm not certain that the seven years of tribulation will begin immediately at the rapture. I think there may there be some buffer time. I don't know how long that might be, okay. but I think, in my estimation, that believers need to be judged right after their rapture, because, and, and this is very this is very important when you read Revelation five. Jesus is being granted dominion not just for his sacrifice. He is being granted dominion because he's worthy, because he is redeemed out of every nation and tongue and kindred and people, a people for his name. He has glorified us. That's why it's important. That, that's another pre tribulation argument no, one's, no one has mentioned either, is that we have to be raptured and glorified by Jesus Christ in order 
so that he will be granted, he will be demonstrated in a court that he is worthy to take dominion because he has shown not only can he save us from our sins, but he can glorify us and redeem us to God. And, and that must take place after we've been raptured, but that also has to take place after we've been judged because the whole universe needs to know exactly what Jesus has done in each one of our lives that has culminated in our judgment. So the, the Bema is not mentioned directly in Revelation, but I think sometime between Revelation 4 and 5, before he is given the scroll, the Bema will have taken place and have been completed. And on that basis, Jesus is determined by God and shown before the court to be worthy to take that scroll. Is that Jason, Jason? Jason over here. Um, thank you so much for some clarity. Well, we know the church and the rapture. Are, you're, you're too kind being clarity. Well, I don't know that. Well, the clarity. you know, it's a new revelation, the, the church and the rapture, but theophany and glory cloud, and these things are established in the Old Testament. So bringing some you know, reference point from that is very good. I have a question. You talk about the reign of Christ beginning with the rapture. And I'm looking for textual support for that. I know in the book of Revelation, from chapter 11 on, almost all of the verbs for reign are future tense. You got the one, uh, I guess, ingressive aorist in Revelation 11:17, where it says, begun to take your reign. And so I'm wondering how you establish you know, a reign from that point and not something that's future. From Revelation 7 or? Well, you said that you, when uh, the rapture occurs at that point, when you talk about the second coming being one event, that the rain begins. Well, I want to clarify. I, I believe that the parousia begins okay. at that time. And I, and I guess if I were to update the model just a little bit, I would make a distinction there about the Son of Man coming with the clouds because to the other gentleman's point, I believe the Bema would have to take place first and then the Son of Man would come with the clouds of heaven to grab the scroll, because at that point he'd be granted dominion. And Revelation 5 does specify that when he takes the scroll, he is worthy, that, that is the dominion, that, that is when he takes dominion. And, and keep in mind, <clears throat> people want to people say that, well, he has dominion now. Well, Hebrews says that we don't see that yet. It's not, we, yes, he's going to have dominion. He has been granted it's like he's president-elect. He is Lord-elect, essentially. But he has not taken the, the, the reins yet. We, we notice that in Revelation. God, uh, I'm having a mess up. I wish I had my, my log off. But in, later on in Revelation, it says, um, Blessed are you who was and is and who has taken your great power and began to reign. Yeah, that's a Revelation 11:17. There you go. Oh, that is, is that what it is? Sort of, you, you'll notice that, that is a formula in Revelation because in Revelation 1 it says uh, him who is and who was and who is coming. By the way, that's not is to come. That is is coming in the Greek. Um, it, it repeats that several times in Revelation. And in the other times it says uh, blessed are him who is and who was and has judged these things and then has begun to reign. Well, if you parallel, parallel those statements... We have uh, is coming is parallel to begun judgment and begun to reign. And, and those are very important, I think. And I, I think it's at Revelation 5 when he takes the scroll that he begins to take dominion um, and reign. And, and the first act of his dominionship is opening that first seal and unleashing the Antichrist on the world. Well, let me ask you right there in Revelation 11, uh, 1 and 2, you have the temple and you have sort of the desecration of the temple in uh, verse 2 with the, uh, the nations trampling underfoot the, the holy place. Uh, would that sort of signal the beginning of a reign? Because when this ingressive heiress is mentioned about beginning uh, to reign. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, so, I, haven't, yeah. I haven't studied the, the, the Greek words on, on that in particular passage. Okay. Um, I, I'm just wondering about the timing because I see the temple as a very pivotal point. Mm -hmm. uh, separating two parts of the, the tribulation in Revelation, and uh, it could be well added. So, the I'll be honest. The the issue about the the Greek verbs, and I, I don't want to cause a firestorm or open up a can of worms or anything in here. Uh, but I am more I 
and they tell you this in Greek, context is just as important, if not more important, than uh, your semantics or the lectural dictionary on things. And except for a few places, I try to tend toward that. And if, if the context leads to a certain interpretation, it can overturn, in some cases, I think, the way I would normally read the word, it, just based on the context. I, I don't have any examples in mind. All I'm saying is that the context. So I try to look at the, the broader picture on that. A uh, couple of things. Um, what do you do? How do you deal with Ephesians 4:10? Uh, we had the passage: "He who descended is also the one who ascended." Then it uses the word "far above." All the heavens, plural. And it seems like that's definitely showing that Christ ascended through the heavens and heaven is above. The language there is pretty, pretty strong. Um, and then there's, pass there's a passage in the book of Hebrews that says Christ passed through, plural, the heavens, the atmosphere of the earth, the starry host, as described in Genesis. And it seems to locate the third heaven above. Um, you know, how do you deal with that passage? Um, well, I think I think you, uh, you pretty much answered the, my, my the way I would answer is that you, the Bible looks at three heavens. Uh, the air around our earth is one, and the stars will be the second heaven, and the third heaven will be that other dimension. I would say, and I hate I don't want to sound sci-fi, but I am an engineer um, by nature, by first by first uh, degree. Um, and I do look at the third heaven as being a different dimension. We have the universe comprising the first and second heaven, and then the third heaven will be beyond this universe. He is in the, the, the spiritual realm being the third heaven. And when he, is, he passes through, he is essentially passing beyond. I think that's the, a better way of looking at it. It's not like, I don't, I don't have the idea that there is some definite point at the edge of our universe in which we're at one moment we're in our second heaven and then immediately he goes into the third heaven. I don't, I don't see it that way. Uh, I see that uh, like in Acts 1 when the clouds are taken up it says that the clouds took him into heaven. Well, if, if the clouds took him into heaven it's, it's talking about the third heaven but the clouds don't go past the first heaven. So somehow the, the third heaven is Co-temporaneous with the other two heavens. I mean, if you think about it, in, in there's there's much that we can't even see of our own natural environment. We can't see X-ray radiation. Well, in the same sense, there's a there's something there that cohabitates this sphere, another dimension, so to speak, in which he is, and and the clouds act as a veil between the two. I've All right, a, a couple other issues. Um, the issue of the trumpet, tying it in with Exodus 19. I think it's problematic. Um, there's trumpets. Uh, Renal Showers has a whole appendix on the use of trumpet. And since we're related, it's related to the mystery nature of the church, uh, it seems like the trumpet is for deliverance as when the nation of Israel, or the, the call us home, as there were separate trumpets calling to battle versus a trumpet to call the soldiers home. And it seems to be related to deliverance instead of the beginning of judgment. To tie those two together, I think would confuse the mystery nature of the church. That's another issue to address, that the church was unforeseen. And even the rapture itself is something new. And to try to tie it in with the coming, second coming, I think would confuse that. Well... I, I wouldn't be beyond saying that that trumpet had two purposes, but uh, both uh, salvation gathering and uh, declaration of judgment. Um, because, but the Old Testament more often that I've seen uses j the trumpet to inaugurate the, the storm cloud of God coming, uh, the theophany, the day of the Lord. Uh, it, it is what most Jews, I believe, would see as being... Um, what it would be used for is that it would inaugurate the theophany of the coming of, of the Lord. 
Um, yes, it is used for gathering, but when you look at the imagery and parallelism in 1 Thessalonians 4, it appears to me that it is, is more in reference to the theophany because you have other things as well. You have the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the shout of command, which I, I deal with these uh, in detail in, in the dissertation. But those are also the shout of command by the arch, archangel and, um, and the trumpet um, and other things indicate are the beginning of a war theophany, uh, not just the trumpet. So I, I think it could be either one. Well, thank you.